Hi, and welcome to part three of pre-registration orientation for newly admitted students in the Faculty of Science at McGill University. This session is intended for students who have been admitted with any previous background other than a Quebec CEGEP diploma. Those of you who've just completed CEGEP should refer to a different set of orientation modules which can be found on the Faculty of Science website. Okay, so let's get started. My name is Nicole Allard, and I'm the Director of Advising Services for the Faculty of Science. As I said, this is part three of my orientation modules, and what we're going to talk about this time is course registration information. Okay, so let's start with the fact that you've all been admitted to one of three, or possibly four, what we call admission groups. That means that, well, let me start by naming the groups. We've got Physical Earth Math and Computer Science, or PEMC for short, Biological, Physical, and Computational Sciences, or BPC, Biological, Biomedical, and Life Sciences, or BBL, and Neuroscience uh, for U1 students only. Okay, so what are these? Well, these are actually groups of departments. So if you've been accepted into physical sciences, for example, you've really been accepted to all of those departments listed there, from atmospheric chemistry all the way through to math and stats. You've been accepted to all of those, and once you've completed your freshman program, you'll be allowed to choose a major from any of those. And you'll also be able to switch majors if you change your mind. It's a pull-down menu on Minerva. It's very easy to do. The same for people in, say, biological sciences. You can choose your majors from anywhere between anatomy and cell biology all the way to pharmacology and switch as much as you like. The only thing is you will not be able to change to a major in a different admission group. So if you were admitted to the biological sciences because you're originally planning to major in, say, biochemistry, but after your freshman year, you decide that really you'd rather major in chemistry you're going to have to apply to transfer into a different admission group. You do that on Minerva via what's called intra-faculty transfer, I-N-T-R-A, intra-faculty transfer. You can find more information about that on our SUSE page in our undergraduate handbook. Essentially, uh, the requirements will be pretty much your freshman year. So you do the same freshman year, no matter what group you're in, more or less. So as long as you're completing that, you should be okay in terms of requirements. There are minimum grade averages, and then admission into a different group will be based on whether or not there's room. It is possible that there is very little room in a particular group in any given year, at which point it will require a fairly high GPA to get in. In other years, if there's more room, you might be able to get into a different group with a GPA around 3.0. So it depends both on your GPA, on the courses that you've completed to make sure you've done the right ones, and also on whether or not there's space in that particular group, admission group in that given year. You can find more information about transferring groups on our website, as I said, and we also have an advisor named Mary Gauthier who specializes in, in uh, helping students understand this if you want to know more about it. For now, rest assured that the freshman, the freshman program is the same for all three groups. So what you do this year is the same no matter which admission group you're in, okay? If you've been admitted into the freshman program, you won't be declaring your major until next year. Some of you have been admitted into U1 because you have at least 24 advanced standing credits. You'll be declaring your major this year. But the rules apply the same to both, okay? Those of you who are entering U1 now will be choosing your major now. So I just wanted to talk a bit about what the difference between the different types of programs. We have a major program, an honors program, and what we call a liberal program. Um, the major program is the core focus of your studies. It's usually somewhere between 54 to 72 credits. Um, it has enough specialization to allow you um, to go on to graduate school when you're done, graduate school being say a master's or a PhD in your field, provided you take the right courses. Um, but it's also uh, broad enough to leave space for things like minors or electives and other areas if you wanna do that. So it's not as specialized 
or as focused as an honors program. It's kind of the one in the middle. Okay, the honors program um, is the one designed specifically uh, to prepare you for a master's or a PhD in that field of study. So say in physics or in atmospheric science. Um, they usually require more credits because they're more focused on one thing. So they're anywhere from 60 to 81 credits, which means you really don't have a lot of space in your degree for a minor or even all that many electives. Normally you would declare your honors program in U2. So that's actually your third out of four years. It goes U0, U1, U2, U3. U0 is your freshman year. U1 is the first year in a major degree. And then after one year in a major, you then apply to get into the honors program or declare the honors program for your last two years. And that's how you do honors for most of our departments. Uh, generally, you need a minimum of 3.0 GPA to get into an honors program. Uh, some departments have a higher cutoff. You should go to and talk to the specific departmental advisors or check their web pages if you want to know more about their honors programs. Now there's an exception to the U2 declaration thing, which is departments of math, physics, and computer science. In those three areas only, you can declare honors right away starting in U1. So again, it's after you've completed your freshman program, but you can go right into honors if you're doing math, computer science, physics, or any of the joint programs that involve those. In all the other areas, you wait until you've done one year as a major, and then you go into honors after uh, for your last two years, okay? Finally, um, we have something called the BSc Liberal, which is broader. By broader, I mean it's less focused on one thing. So you have fewer credits in one discipline, and we call that your core science component. Now it's 45 to 49 credits. So that's fewer credits than a major and a lot fewer than an honors. So this is for students who really have multidisciplinary, they have varied interests. So you would do, if you're doing the BSc liberal, you're gonna do a core science component in one science, then you have to have a secondary program. You have to have another program to show breadth and um, multidisciplinarity basically. That other program could be a minor in science, which will be, you know, 18 to 24 credits, a minor in arts, management, education, music, or even another core science component. Um, you could also do a major concentration in arts, that's 36 credits, almost as many credits as your core science component, but not quite. So suffice it to know that this BSc liberal is intended for students with broad interest. They want to learn a little bit about at least two different things as opposed to a whole lot about one thing. Um, it's good if you're interested in, say, hitting the job market after your degree or going on to what we call professional school, which is things like getting a master's of business administration or going to medicine or law, uh, dentistry, physical therapy, those kinds of things. Um, they're interested in multidisciplinarity. Now, they're also perfectly happy if you come in with a major program or an honors program. It's not that they prefer the liberal, but they're perfectly happy with it if that's your interest. Where the liberal won't work is if you're interested in eventually applying for a master's or a PhD in a particular academic field. So if you want to go on and get your master's and your PhD in physics, let's say, then you shouldn't do the liberal in physics because it's not focused enough. You need to do either the honors or the major and if you do the major, make sure that you choose your courses in consultation with your advisor so that you're doing the right ones. So that's really what these are about, knowing that the BSc Liberal is less, less focused on one thing, broader, more about other things. Now, whatever you choose now, you can hop back and forth between Liberal Honors and Major in the next two or three years. So you're not uh, required to know exactly what you want to do at this point. I'll let you know that most students start with a major and then decide afterwards. You know, they, they move around once they've started out in the major, but really it's up to you. Except knowing that you can't do honors most programs until after you've done one year of a major. Okay, minor programs. Minor programs are optional unless you're in the BSc Liberal. Okay, for the Liberal, you have to have a second program. For everybody else, for majors and honors students, 
you don't have to do a minor. Um, and a minor does not make your degree better in any way. It's just a reflection of your interest. So if you are majoring in biochemistry and you're really interested in, in business as well, because ultimately you're thinking you might want to become an entrepreneur, then you should probably minor in entrepreneurship or minor in management because you're going to be taking those courses anyway. But let's say you're majoring in biochemistry and eventually you want to go on either to get your master's or your PhD in biochemistry, or maybe you want to go to medical school. It doesn't matter then. You know, why have a minor when you can take your electives in a lot of different areas if you have many different interests? If you're interested, if you really are going to focus your electives in one area anyway, sure, take a minor. Otherwise, it just doesn't matter. It's not going to change your admissibility to any future programs, and it's not going to change whether or not you're employable. It's really just showing your own interests. Okay, so minors, optional unless you're doing BSc liberal. Okay, now, as I keep saying, some of you are going into U1 and having to declare a major. Most of you are going to have to complete the freshman program. So the way it works at McGill is, let's, let's pretend you have absolutely no advanced standing. You do one year in the freshman program, you get your general science background, and then you choose your major or honors or liberal program, and you do that for the next three years. Okay? So, your freshman program, that's what you'd be doing this year, coming in um, from high school or wherever you're coming in from. Your freshman program consists of seven specific courses, um, and then you probably have room for two, maybe three electives. Depending on the courses you take, it's usually about two electives. So the seven courses um, are, can be structured in two different ways. Either you can do two math courses with four foundational sciences and one complementary science, or you do three math courses with three foundational sciences and one complementary science. Okay, I'm going to get into details, show you more about that in a minute. One thing I want to remind you of is regardless of whether or not you have advanced standing, you still have to complete the freshman program. So maybe you did some APs, maybe you did an AP in Cal 1 and physics and a couple of other things, and you're coming in with a whole bunch of credits. Um, and so you're, you're U1, because U1 means you have 24 advanced standing credits. Well, that's great. But you still need to look at those advanced standing credits and see if you have completed our freshman program because any outstanding requirements, anything you haven't already done, you still have to complete at McGill. So you do have to complete the requirements of the freshman program regardless of whether you're coming into U0 or U1. So if you've got a lot of advanced standing in your U1, you'll need to use some of your electives to complete the freshman program. Okay? So what is the freshman program specifically? Well, as I said, you have to pick either two or three math courses. And those are Cal 1, which is Math 139, Calculus, that's called Calculus with Pre-Cal, Math 140 called Calculus 1, or Math 150 Calculus A. These are all different versions of Cal 1. The first one, calculus with precal. I, I don't have the full name on here. I'm sorry, but that's what it's called. Calculus with precalculus would be for students who either um, certainly students who've never taken calculus before, um, and perhaps need a refresher on their precalculus course as well. So whether you call that um, precal or functions and relations, there's different names for it, but uh, the, the, whatever course you took before calculus, if you're not feeling too confident about that, you really want a major review of your pre-calculus, then you should take Math 139. Math 140 would be for students who are perfectly confident with their pre-cal course. They've never taken calculus, but that's fine. They did well in pre-cal. They're, they're confident. You can do Math 140. Um, Math 140 can also be taken by students who have uh, even done calculus uh, as an AP and just want to refresh. So that's, it. Math 140 doesn't have as much of a pre-calculus review. It'll have a little bit of a review at the beginning, but it won't have as much. 
So it's going to dive into calculus a little sooner. Finally, Math 150 Calculus A would be for students that are very confident in their math background. Um, math 150 and 151 go together, so they work as a team, uh, Cal A and Cal B. You would do Cal A in the fall, Cal B in the winter. And with those two courses, you've basically covered the content of Calculus 1, Calculus 2, and Calculus 3. So it's a very accelerated course. It just covers this stuff a lot faster. So that's for students who are very, very confident in their math background, or even students who have already done Calculus 1 um, and are confident with it, and they just want to do 150 and 151 so they can get through the equivalent of Cal 1, Cal 2, and Cal 3. So they're ready to dive into, say, honors in math starting next year because it's good to have Cal 3 done ahead of time if you want to go into honors math, honors physics, or honors um, computer science. So that's something to think about. Now, of course, the alternative, if you prefer to do them a little more slowly, is you could still do Cal 1 in the fall, Cal 2 in the winter, and then you could do Cal 3, say, in the summer, or even next fall, if you wanted to. Um, the other thing to think about is if you come in with advanced standing in Calculus 1, well, you could just do Cal 2 in the fall and Cal 3 in the winter, if that's what you wanted to do. There's a lot of different ways to complete these calculus series. And to get information relevant to your specific situation, I really urge you to talk to your, your SUSE advisor. And again, you'll be getting an introductory email from that person early next week. So you'll be able to start having this conversation. Okay? Um, so that's the first math, is some version of Cal 1. Now, if you're only going to do two math courses, you would mix that with one of the other ones, either Cal 2, which could be Math 141, the regular Cal 2, or Math 151, the accelerated Cal 2. Um, or you could choose to do linear algebra, Math 133. We no longer have Math 134. Um, we have uh, gotten rid of this one, so we, you can ignore that. It's just Math 133, linear algebra. Uh, so those are your math courses. You take two or three of these. So one, one version of Cal 1, and then either one version of Cal 2 or, one ver or linear algebra, or you could do all three. You could do linear algebra, Cal 1, Cal 2. Okay, that's the math part of your freshman program. Then you have to choose your foundational science courses. So if you do two math, you have to choose four from these, this list. This list here, from these six courses. If you do three math courses, then you only have to pick three from these courses. Basically what you've got is Organismal Bio 1, Cell and Molecular Bio 2. These are freshman bio with labs. General Chem 1, Gen Chem 2. This is freshman chemistry with labs. So one's fall, winter, fall, winter. Physics, we have two different levels or types of intro physics. You can only do one stream or the other. So you could either do 101 and 102. So that's intro to mechanics and intro electromagnetism. These are the physics that are really aimed at students in the biological sciences. Whereas the other stream is physics 131 and 142, so mechanics and waves and electromagnetism and optics. These are really aimed at students who are more in the physical sciences, more interested in um, chemistry, physics, earth and planetary science, that sort of thing. Um, so, you would pick one stream or the other. They're put together like this because they're considered to be sort of equivalent. So you can't get, normally you don't get credit for both 101 and 131. Or you choose one of these two and one of these two. And you try and stick to your stream. So if you start with 101, you do 102. If you do 131, you do 142. The difference is, is mostly in how mathematical they are at the beginning. Um, so the physics 131, 142 stream is much more math based and really oriented towards students in the physical sciences. If you're in the BPC group, the biological physical computational, you also preferably want to do 131, 142. But ultimately it doesn't matter that much which one you do, but it's a better fit if you focus on um, 
the one that fits your future goals. If you're not sure about your future goals, don't worry about it. Um, special rules regarding freshman physics. Uh, so yeah, if you've come in with advanced standing for physics 101 and 102 and or 102, you're still allowed to take 131 or 142 for credit if you want to, but you certainly don't have to. Again, I know this is kind of complicated, so you're going to want to talk about this with your advisor. This, this rule has been put in for students who, for, for whatever reason, the course that you did in, say, in, in high school ended up giving you an AP for Physics 101, but you want to major in Physics. So you really feel like you would do better if you had the Physical Science stream. We're saying, yeah, you can come and do the Physical Science stream and you'll get credit for both of them, even though you've got uh, advanced standing for that one. So that's really what that's for. Um, but again, talk to your advisor if you're not sure. Okay. So if we review this quickly then, we start with you do two or three of these math courses. You do three or four of these, so biochem physics. And then you have one more requirement, which is a complementary science course. So you can pick um, either uh, atmospheric and oceanic sciences 100, Comp 202, Earth System Science 104, Geography 205, or Psych 100, or you can also use any of these that you haven't already taken. So let's say you did Bio 111, Bio 112, uh, Chem 110, and Chem 120 as your four foundational science courses. And now you've got one complementary science course yet left. Well, you could do Physics 101 if you wanted as your complementary science course, because you haven't already done that. Or you could do ESIS 104 or one of these. So it's one of these or any of the other foundational science courses you haven't already done. That's your fifth, that's your seventh course. Um, and there's more information about this on our website and also in our handbook and our orientation guide. I know it sounds complicated when you hear it described this way. It actually is fairly clear, um, but it's helpful to sit down with an advisor if you're, if you're not understanding it. So just you'll be able to have a meeting with your advisor soon. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, if you do know what you're planning to major on in next year, and you're wondering, well, what are the right courses I should take for that major? You can go to this website, and um, it's on. It's actually our website, and we have program-specific advice. So if you know what you're planning to major in, we can recommend courses to take in your freshman year to make sure that you meet all the prerequisites for that major. If you're not sure what you want to major in, let your advisor know, and they'll tell you what the best, the the safest route is to cover all your bases. Okay. Alrighty. Other questions we often get. What is a normal course load? The thing with McGill is we think in credits now. You don't think necessarily in the number of courses. You think about the number of credits. Because the number of credits attached to a course is an indication of how much time you're going to spend on it. So a regular credit, a regular lecture-based course. So let's take Psych 100. That just has lectures. It has no labs. That'll be three credits. Our regular lecture-based courses are generally three credits. That means that you meet three hours a week for the lecture, and you're expected to work six hours a week independently at home to do well in that course. So that's the usual ponderation, right? For every one hour of lecture, assume two hours of at-home study time. So three uh, lecture course is three credits. Many of our courses that combine a lecture with a lab will be four credits. Not always, but usually. Um, and that depends on how many hours are in the lab. So sometimes you have a four credit course because it's got a lab and it's a reflection of the fact that it's going to take you a lot more time. Like you have to go to these long labs and then you have to do the lab work. So when we're talking about what's a normal course load, a normal course load is around 15 credits per term. So if all you had was lecture courses, it would be five lecture courses. 
if all you have is lab courses that are four credits each, well, it would be, huh, you couldn't get to 15. You would do 16 or 12. You would either do 12, no, babe, wait, well, my math has gone wonky. You would probably end up doing 16 credits and you would do four courses, each with a lab. And that would be four four credit courses for 16 credits. Usually it's a mix. So generally people will end up with like 14 credits in the fall, 16 credits in the winter, or 14 and 14, but you're aiming to be somewhere around 15 credits is the normal course load. Now, what's considered to be a full-time course load, and that's especially relevant for anybody who's an international student because you have to maintain a full-time course load, that's at least 12 credits per term. Okay. Now that might be three courses if those three courses are all four credits, but it's a minimum of 12 credits per term makes you full time. But the usual course load for people is about 15 per term. That's how you would get out in four years with no summer courses or anything else. Um, and as I said, you can't always do exactly 15 per term, but you know, get around there depending on, on whether or not you have lab courses. Normally, you're making the decision on how, where you want to be, whether you want to do 12 credits or 15 credits, is got a lot to, or 16 credits even, has got a lot to do with um, what's going on in your life. If all you're doing is being a student right now, um, then you're probably fine with 14 or 16 credits. But if you have other things that are taking up a lot of your time, such as, um, if you're a caregiver for elderly parents or if you have children at home or if you're working for 12 or 15 hours a week to help pay for university these are all things that might take up a lot of your time and could lead you to think about maybe doing 12 or 13 credits instead so that you have time to to do well in everything that that's on your plate um, so only you can figure out the best balance for you in your life if you end up doing 12 credits each term, then you can easily make up those other six credits in the summer. Um, you could do two, six, two, three credit courses in May, let's say, or one in May, one in June. Um, that's easy to do and still have a summer break afterwards. So it's really about what works best with your life. Um, that being said, there are two things you need to think about. One is if you're thinking of applying to professional programs, most specifically medicine, law, or dentistry, they tend to want to see a regular course load in the academic year. They want to see you do about 30 credits in fall and winter. Now, I say about 30 because, of course, we're back to that, you know, lab course thing. So you could do 29 or 31 but it's gotta be somewhere around 30. It could be 15 one term, 16 the other term, 14, 16, 16, 16, 14, 14, but you wanna be somewhere within your third, close to 30 credits in your academic year. That's very important to a lot of medical schools. Um, they also tend to want you to complete your, your program in your four years. Um, the other thing to think about is if you, either have a McGill scholarship or want to be eligible for McGill scholarships later. You have to have a minimum of 27 credits in the academic year. Uh, so that would be, you could do 12 one term, 15 the other, you could do 14 and 14. So again, it's across the academic year. You have to have a minimum of 27 credits and all of them have to have regular grading. You can't have SU grading on those credits. So it's a minimum of 27 regular graded credits in the fall and winter if you hold a McGill scholarship or if you wish to be eligible for one later. Other than those two things, McGill scholarships and professional programs in your future, if you're thinking of applying, say, to graduate school, a master's or a PhD um, in your field, or if you're thinking of going on, say, to management, an MBA, um, or maybe hitting the job market, it really doesn't matter how many credits you do each term. It's only for medicine and scholarships that you have to think about that, okay? Again, your advisor can help you here with your own personal situation. 
Okay, been talking about advanced standing a lot. Now, I'm going to tell you some general information in this module. We have a lot of um, new policies specific to the COVID-19 situation that I'm going to be discussing at the orientation event on Thursday morning. Um, so right now I'm just giving you a brief sort of introduction, um, but the, the greater detail will be provided on Thursday. Okay, so you can find out more about advanced standing in general at this website. Um, and what it means is usually that we're granting you credits towards your university degree. So we're, we're granting you basically university credits based on your previous education, your pre-U education. And you get advanced standing credits if you've completed an international baccalaureate, a French baccalaureate, a European bac, if you've done A-levels, um, if you've taken advanced placement exams, if you did the German Abitur, those are generally the ones where you can come in with credits towards your degree. Um, those credits will appear on your transcript. You don't get any grades, but you'll get credit. So you might come in with, um, you know, 15 credits or six credits or 24 credits or even 30 credits. If those courses are equivalent to courses offered at McGill, we will list what we call exemptions. And those are courses that we are crediting you for. So we give you three credits for Bio 111, if, we, if you've taken the equivalent already. Um, or Math 139 or Math 140. Um, sometimes you're going to get just generic credits. You'll just see that you have been granted 15 advanced standing credits and there's no specific course. That's because there's not necessarily an equivalent at McGill. Or there is, but it's not a basic part of, a, of your um, freshman program or your science program. So we haven't. Um, uh, articulated that equivalency yet. So the, the everything that could go towards your science programs has normally been articulated if we're talking advanced standing, okay? Um, now these are not university transfer credits. I'm not talking about courses you took at another university and then are transferring here. These are courses you took in a pre-U program. Um, so you can use those to satisfy your freshman program requirements. Um, and you'll know what they are fairly soon. They'll be put on your transcript um, once, your, once your grades are in. If you're not sure which ones you have, you can check on this website, as I mentioned before, and you can talk to your academic advisors um, next week to find out more information. So these are credits that you get towards your degree. You can get up to a maximum of 30, so it could knock off a whole year. But do remember that even if you get a whole bunch of advanced standing credits, you've still got to make sure that you've completed your freshman program. And any outstanding or missing courses, if you don't already have them, you've got to complete at McGill. So what's the difference when you get admitted, whether you're coming in as U0, which we call a freshman student, or U1? It's really based solely on the number of advanced standing credits you're granted. Not which credits you're granted, just the number of credits. So you are U0 or a freshman program if you have 23 or fewer advanced standing credits you are then considered a freshman. If you have 24 or more advanced standing credits, you are considered U1 and you have to declare a major. Now, as I said, nobody looks at what, you know, for your U1, U0, it doesn't matter what those advanced standing credits are in. So if you got 30 advanced standing credits, it's possible that only 12 of them are going towards your freshman program. And the other ones are just, you know, unidentified credits, they're electives basically. So you have to make sure that you complete your freshman program before you graduate and talk to your advisor about that to, to uh, figure out what's needed if, if you have any questions. Um, what's really important, as we put here, is that you need to complete 120 credits to complete your degree. If you come in with 30, well, you only have to do another 90. You can stay and do your full four years if you want to. You just don't have to. There's that flexibility for you. Um, but you absolutely must meet your freshman requirements. Okay. Um, there was one other thing I was going, oh yeah, well, in terms of, I'm, I'm going to talk a whole lot more about um, advanced standing and specific credits on, uh, on Thursday morning. Okay. Uh, so uh, Thursday morning, that would be June 11. So registration advice. Well, you need to register. Ideally, you should be registering for both terms this summer. 
So you want to register for the whole academic year now. You can keep changing your registration. As I talked about in a previous module, we have the course change period that runs from now all the way through till September for fall courses and January for winter courses. But it's good to get you know, the basic idea of what you want to do registered now. You can always change things as you go along if you need to. Um, if a course has a lab component, like say general chemistry, you have to register for a lab also. Um, when you're choosing, when you're making your schedule, start with your required courses, the courses you must take for your freshman program or your major if you're in U1. Then fit in your complementary courses and then your electives because that's sort of the order of importance, right? You got to get those required courses done. You can maybe have some choices in your complementary, so if one's full, you could take a different one. And then electives you figure out. Uh, last based on where you have space and what's available. Okay. Um, general academic advice. It kind of boils down to try and keep up as much as possible with your coursework from the beginning. By that, I don't mean drive yourself crazy and think about nothing but coursework, but try and keep up as much as possible. Um, Sometimes people are surprised with how quickly courses move or how challenging their midterms can be. Not everybody is. And, and you know, it really depends more on your academic uh, background and, and how, how much you're used to the way McGill teaches. Um, but it, it's the best thing to do is to try and keep up right from the beginning. And, you know, if you're having trouble understanding stuff, to talk to your advisors, talk to your professors right away um, so that you you don't fall behind. Um, this is something we often hear. Everybody, we being advisors, everybody else seems to be doing fine, but I'm feeling really stressed, I'm feeling overwhelmed, but everybody else is doing fine. Um, and if, you, if I had a penny for how many students tell me that every year, the first thing I can guarantee you is clearly it's not just you, because I'm hearing this a lot. So, it's normal to feel a little overwhelmed at first. This is all brand new, especially this year, right? We've got the whole COVID thing going on. Things are different. It's not unusual to feel a bit overwhelmed. Um, at the same time, you shouldn't be suffering in silence. If you do feel overwhelmed, you need to tell somebody. Tell your academic advisor, tell your professor, tell Melissa, the wellness advisor, tell somebody so we can help you to balance it out and figure out what's going on. Um, and that's what we want to do. Your success is important to us. We're not here to try and make it tough so that you'll fail out or there's no such thing as a weeder course. We're not trying. We don't want you to not do well. We want you to succeed. And to get there, you've got, you've got to let us know if you're facing any challenges so we can help you. Um, but know that it's really common to feel a little overwhelmed now and then. But the best way to handle it is to tell someone so we can help to uh, get you back in solid footing. You know, maybe you, maybe you just need a stress management workshop. Maybe you need to learn more about time management. Maybe you need to talk to a wellness advisor. Maybe you just need to vent for 20 minutes and, and talk to your peers and find out everybody else is feeling the same way you are. I can absolutely guarantee you that you have the academic background and the ability to be here. We didn't make a mistake when we accepted you. You are the person we want here at McGill, and we are dedicated to, to help you to succeed. And all you have to do is let us know, and we will do that, okay? All right. Important dates and deadlines to keep in mind. So classes begin Wednesday, September 2nd. Um, the course change period, as I mentioned earlier, ends September 15th. That's also your deadline for the SU option. Now, remember, freshmen cannot choose the SU option, only people in U1. Freshmen, you'll get there. You can do it next year. The withdrawal with refund deadline, so that's the deadline by which you can withdraw from a course but not drop it. You'll still get your money back, though. That's September 22nd. And the final withdrawal deadline is October 27th. That's the deadline to withdraw from courses with no refund. I mentioned that in a prior uh, module, but I just wanted to remind you. Okay. 
Finally, I want to remind you again about our BSC orientation booklet. It has all this information in it in one handy dandy place. Get on our website, download it, hang on to it, refer to it. It'll tell you everything you need to know. You'll also find everything you need to know in our undergraduate handbook. That, however, applies to the next four years of your studies, whereas the orientation booklet, we narrowed it down to what you need to worry about this year. So look at both, or if you're just picking one, choose the orientation booklet for now. Okay, I very much look forward to seeing you all virtually on Thursday morning on June 11th. Um, until then, have a great day.